Hey folks, it's Phelan McFailin again. It's a Tuesday morning here, and I'm, I'm just doing a very, very brief, it's going to be probably two, three videos tops on the refining motif connected with the restoration of Israel. And I started yesterday, I was doing a 20 minute, I was, well, I had planned on doing a 20 minute um, lesson. And suddenly it cut off right at the 11 minute mark. So I need to check that out because I've been experimenting with this Google Meet. And I'm pretty happy with it so far. But if it's going to do that, uh, you know, just cut off right in the middle of my presentation. And obviously that's not good. So I'm going to take a look at that. But um, I'm going to get back to where I was yesterday. I had just discussed, uh, let's see, we were discussing Ezekiel chapter 20. And I went through Ezekiel chapter 20, and I showed where it's, um, it speaks of, where the prophet speaks of the purging out of the rebels, the bringing of Israel into the bond of the covenant, and then the purging out of the rebels. Um, so that, of course, matches that motif of, of, um, of refinement, where the impurities are purged out of the metals, um, so that the resultant product, the final product, is pure. There's no impurity left when the whole process is completed. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 38, and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I'll bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. So he's talking about the restoration of Israel, but the restoration of Israel as connected with that, uh, with that purification, with that refinement. Uh, which results, of course, in the purging out of the impurities of the rebels, of the of the non-believers, of the wicked, and that's also um, that whole concept is also followed up in other scriptures, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But I also want to go to Ezekiel chapter twenty-two because this is the um, this is the text where, and you know what? Here we go. Uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 22, verse 18, uh, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because ye are all become dross, behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. Talking about the great tribulation. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. So he's talking about the time when um, Israel will be gathered into the city and uh, refined, uh, melted down, so to speak. Uh, verse 21, yeah, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and you should be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I, Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. So again, very, very, um, you know, something to look at, definitely, because you want these, uh, you want to make sure that you don't miss this motif that runs throughout the prophetic scriptures of refining. Now, the preterists and the replacement theologians will tell you that um, that this did take place in AD 70, but it was sort of like a figurative, allegorical sort of thing. So it's not the same. It's what happened was Israel was refined, but subjectively, it was all subjective. It's hypothetical. It's, you know, Anything can mean anything, basically. There's no final product that where you could point to and say, "Okay, that's Israel. That's the nation that God wanted to um, wanted to chastise to make them pure. That's the nation." And this is matches fully the prophets. They can't say that. They have to subjectify that language and they have to make it mean something hypothetical. But we know that the Lord, when He saves, He he experientially uh, makes one holy, right? So it's not just as a positional holiness. It's not just the positional righteousness that we believe uh, by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's also an objective experiential work because of the, um, the moral government of God requires him to make those he saves holy. 
it's not something where, okay, well, you know, you're holy in my eyes. You could still go out and do this and do that and do this and do that and still be saved. He's going to, you know, if he plants a tree, it's going to produce that fruit. If he plants that tree, it's going to produce the fruit, buddy. It's not going to produce the fruit, the old fruit that it was producing before. It's going to produce different fruit. Make the tree good and its fruit will be good. So that's what he's going to do with Israel. He's going to make Israel good so that Israel is righteous. And, uh, you know, that's all there is to it. I mean, if you don't believe that, then there's no point of even of even studying the scriptures because you're going to miss these all of these uh, motifs. Now, here's another one, and I'm not going to go through this uh, because this you can read for yourself, but it's also in Ezekiel chapter 24 where he talks about the... Um, he talks about the pot and, uh, you know, put it, water put into the pot and to gather the pieces into it, even every good piece of thigh in the shoulder, etc. He's talking about melting that, melting all of that, that stuff that's in the pot and then see, and then melting the scum out of it. Um, I don't have time to actually go through that, though, but it's going to be in uh, Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 11. So it's going to he's talking about. Uh, the meltdown again it's how using that refining motif uh, so the next one I want to look at is Zechariah I'm going to jump a little bit here I'm going to jump to Zechariah chapter 13 let's see Zechariah chapter 13 and I want to say just before I before I get into that is that the refining motif that's not the only motif that is used there's also the marriage motif um, you know Israel was espoused under the old covenant, but some uncleanness was found in the espoused bride. So God put away the uh, the the bride, right? And he but he's going to restore her. He's going to bring her again. We learned from Hosea. It's the same bride that's going to be espoused under the new covenant. So there's a there's an uncleanness found in the bride under the old covenant. The same bride's going to be called recalled under the new covenant. But first, she needs to be given a change of raiment. So that's, that's another motif that we can look at in another study lesson. But in uh, Zechariah chapter 13, um, verse uh, 8 says, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third part shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. There you go. Now, um, Zechariah had just spoken about, in verse uh, chapter 12, rather, had just spoken about that time when all the nations will surround Jerusalem. All the nations will um, <clears throat> will come against Jerusalem, and that at that time, Israel will be delivered. And not only that, but uh, let's see. Here we go in um, Zechariah 12, uh, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Talking about the time when he regenerates Israel, when he regenerates the nation, national regeneration. This goes all the way back to uh, to Leviticus, um, and is more particularly to Deuteronomy chapter 30, which is talking about where you see those motifs, those expulsion, regathering motifs together. Israel's regathering is accompanied by uh, national regeneration. So that's really the thing. You know, when he regenerates somebody, when he regenerates a person, he makes them righteous. When he regenerates a person, doesn't only just make them, you know, subjectively, positionally righteous. He also cleans up their lives. He also makes them clean up their ways and their acts. So it's it's not just a subjective righteousness. It's, it's an experiential righteousness. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. You know, most of Christendom today has actually gone off the rails as far as, you know, understanding what righteousness is. Righteous is as righteous does. Um, and, you know, there's two parts to a saving faith. There's a, a faithful hearing, and then there's a faithful doing. Now, Abraham, um, experienced, well, Abraham experienced both in his own person. We have the faith of Abraham. We believe everything that the Lord Jesus Christ tells us. We believe what the scriptures reveal as to our salvation. But we also, based on that belief, 
we also follow the will of God, uh, which he has revealed to us. So important stuff.